Prime Minister says that Britain has accomplished its mission in Afghanistan. It's one thing to step onto Afghan soil and declare the future rosy, but what was the mission and what was the cost? Also tonight, this man wants a doctor to be able to kill him. He tells us why. Matthew Perry, Chandler from Friends, is here to argue the case for specialist drug courts. It seems a whole lot of nothing, so why has Russia objected so vehemently to Canada's claim to own the North Pole? What are we looking at now, Mark? Do you remember this area at all? Um, vaguely, yeah, there's, um... And what's it like to be a modern slave? It's not typically four or five o'clock in the morning. Um, I kind of just work constantly throughout the day. There's no, you can't ask for a cup of tea or anything like that or anything to eat or anything. Prime Minister's official spokesman spent part of today trying to extract words from the Prime Minister's supposed mouth. The two words were mission and accomplished, words which should never be run together since they appeared on the superstructure of an aircraft carrier when George Bush was boasting about what the Americans had achieved in Iraq. The Prime Minister was asked by a naughty reporter whether the same might be said of Afghanistan. He thought so. Mark Urban reports. Prime Minister was on a pre-Christmas visit to troops in Helmand province. Had they accomplished their mission, he was asked. I'm proud that we made that promise and have kept that promise, and I think our troops can leave with their head held, heads held high over a job very well done. But which mission? It kept changing, and that was part of the problem. Early on, British Special Forces helped topple the Taliban and hunt al-Qaeda. Then, at the Bonn conference, the UK volunteered to lead the Afghan counter-narcotics effort. 2001, uh, the US Secretary of State awarded the Taliban $40 million by way of a reward for eradicating opium in Afghanistan. So let's just cut forward then 12 years to now, where Afghanistan produces more than half of the world's heroin-grade opium, and Helmand produces more than half of Afghanistan's opium for export. It was only five years in, in 2006, that things got really difficult for British troops when ministers packed them off to the south on what was described as a reconstruction mission. We would be perfectly happy to leave in three years time without firing one shot because our mission is to protect the reconstruction. The Taliban were resurgent in Helmand and Kandahar provinces and the arrival of Western troops touched off huge battles. It took four years, hundreds of lives and billions of pounds to get on top of it, just about. Now, our men have fought well, they've fought professionally, they've done their best, but they weren't able to answer the questions that aren't essentially answerable by military means, which is creating or establishing and sustaining uh, a state or a country that's able to sustain itself and there's no question we failed to do that. The final phase of Britain's war, the last couple of years, has focused on preparing the Afghans for NATO's withdrawal. Oh, oh, Tens of billions have been invested in forces that are still lacking in many respects. But there is a national mood of wanting to take responsibility and see the back of NATO and that's echoed by the President. Uh, on the security front, the entire NATO exercise uh, was one that uh, uh, caused Afghanistan a lot of suffering uh, and a lot of loss of life and no gains because the country is not secure. Uh, I'm not happy to say that, well, there is partial security. That's not what we are seeking. What we wanted was absolute security and a clear cut war against terrorism. So what's Britain's scorecard at the end of it? Well, on the initial phase, eliminating Al-Qaeda's bases, positive. On the counter-narcotics mission that followed, that was a disaster. As for the insurgency in the south, which was at least in part caused by NATO's arrival, they just about got on top of it in the end. And the final phase, the withdrawal, leaving behind capable Afghan security forces, 
while the jury still has to be out on that one, although one can be cautiously optimistic, it'll turn out better than Britain's withdrawal in 1841, from which there was a single survivor. Well, we join now to discuss whether the mission has really been accomplished in Afghanistan by Javid Nada, an Afghan and director of the British and Irish agencies, Afghanistan Group, Heather Barr, who works on Afghanistan for Human Rights Watch, and from our Edinburgh studio by Sir William Patey, former British ambassador to Afghanistan. How does it seem to you? Do you think it's a mission accomplished? It's very hard to say. Um, I think the uh, mission that was said by the, by the Prime Minister was that there is a basic level of security and also that Afghanistan is no longer a safe haven for, for the um, Al-Qaeda. I think this is a very UK-centric uh, mission. For the uh, 30 million of Afghans, um, the mission can be a different thing. It's by far not accomplished. OK, let's come to that in a second or two. So, William Patey, it is a very partial analysis, isn't it, this mission accomplished nine? Yes, I think it's a... I think it's an unfortunate phrase. Uh, I think actually Mark Urban's report, the scorecard, is I wouldn't uh, dispute that at all. It's a mixed picture. Uh, the initial uh, reason for going in was to overthrow the Taliban and to uh, remove a, uh, a safe haven for Al Qaeda. Uh, later on, the mission got more and more complicated uh, and almost impossible to achieve by military means. I think uh, I think I would agree that the uh, the counter narcotics mission is. Uh, has not achieved very much. Indeed, I would I'd suggest that it is impossible to deal with the supply side of, uh, of narcotics. You probably have to deal with the demand side, and uh, that's, a, that's a whole different debate. But I think it is a mixed picture, but I think the, as far as the military are concerned, they've done what they, they, they could do. Uh, and I think the Prime Minister is right to talk about being able to leave with their head held high. The fact that Afghanistan isn't a, a peaceful democracy is not the military's fault. Heather Barr, how does it seem from one of, the, one of the other criteria, one of the other things that they were supposed to do while they were there was to assist in the creation of a civil society, particularly as regards the rights of women and the like. Mm. How does it seem from that point of view? Well, not like good news at all. And you notice that uh, the Prime Minister hasn't talked about that today. Um, and we haven't heard people talking about it much at all, even though in 2001... Um, you know, we heard a lot from, from Tony Blair, from Sherry Blair, about how it was the oppression of women was one of the, the reasons that action was needed so urgently in Afghanistan. And actually what we've seen over the last seven eight, or eight months is, is a, a quite serious rollback of women's rights by the Afghan government. Jeremy, now you mentioned earlier that uh, it was a very Anglo-centric, very British-centric view of what had been going on in Afghanistan, that it didn't necessarily seem like that to, to Afghans. Mm. In what respect? The uh, country is uh, still one of the poorest countries in the world. It is, um, the, unfortunately, the most corrupt in the world. Um, the humanitarian needs and development, ne development needs are very high still. Uh, and it is a bedrock for uh, extremism. But you've got rid of the Taliban government. We have, yes. Um, and we are proud also that we have 350,000 security forces that now undertake the absolute majority of security operations in Afghanistan. That's a good, positive thing. But the uh, reasons um, of op optimism um, are not, um, uh, do not overshadow the reasons for pessimism, unfortunately. Pessimistic looking forward, you mean? Yes. Um, the Taliban um, have uh, vowed to disrupt the next year's elections, um, although there is going to be a robust um, um, response from the Afghanistan security forces, but it seems that um, they still have the ability to uh, commit uh, suicide attacks. They can uh, organize uh, security uh, threats in all major Afghanistan cities. But they also have been able to um, uh, kill um, aid workers and government uh, public servants. At that level, Sir William, it hasn't been a great success, has it? Well, I think, it's, I think it's down to the Afghans now. I think what the international forces uh, have done, they can't do any more. And I think the arguments about staying on, I, I would disagree with. I think uh, it's for the Afghans to take this forward. Uh, they've got a security force. The British forces have contributed to building up that force. As long as we continue to support that force with aid and development assistance, it's really now for the Afghans to take this forward. I think there's not much more we can do. And education is much better, isn't it, Heather Barr? 
Yes and no. Um, <laughs> I mean, about half of Afghan girls are still not going to school. Um, and I guess the real concern is whether we're at a point now which is, is sort of a, a, the beginning of a, a longer trajectory of progress or whether things are actually going to turn around and go back. And if you look at, there are lots of different indicators, not just about women's rights, in which things are going the wrong direction. But uh, if, this isn't a, if this isn't a permanent change in Afghan society, it's been an awful lot of blood and treasure spent to no effect, hasn't it? Well, it can be a permanent change, but that requires a long-term commitment by the international community, not just to funding schools and clinics and hospitals, but also to putting political pressure on the Afghan government to respect human rights. But we're already seeing and hearing noises about deals with the Taliban, of whom there are still many thousands left in Afghanistan, aren't there? Yes. Uh, so what, uh, what's the way forward? Well, the way forward is for, for the international community, which has invested so much in Afghanistan, to, to remain involved, to remain supportive of human rights, of women's rights, and to take a firm stand that while an agreement with the Taliban might be desirable, it can't be at a cost to human rights. How does it seem to you as an Afghan? Um, I believe that um, Sir William was quite right, that the Afghans will take responsibility and they should. Um, but what is important is that um, the, the changes that have happened for the uh, military, for the civil society, um, that is sustained for a longer period of time so that it, they are not irreversible. So, William? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the big lesson we have to learn from history and from the Russian experience in Afghanistan is that the international community have to stay engaged financially and we have to continue to support the development of Afghanistan and the security forces. And uh, that, uh, the Afghans won't be able to do it on their own, but they have to take most of the responsibility. I would say to Helen Barr, I mean, I think two and a half million girls in school for the last 10 years is progress. And the fact that so many uh, young Afghans are going to school should, in my view, make a big difference to society. Okay, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.